Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Let me know if you can hear me. All right, good. Yes, hello, thank you all for joining me this wonderful Friday afternoon. Uh, someone last time said, all right, have a good weekend. And I was like, wait a second, I think I teach these people again. I don't know if I do. So here I am. We're we'll moving on into the pulmonology section here in just a few moments. How was the uh, exam this morning? It looked like it went pretty well, actually. All right. And Aaron. Yeah, lots of reading. Yeah, that one's a bit. That one and the next one for that class are definitely some uh, some readers. Yeah, I don't I don't blame you, Allison. It is a dentist scene where you feel that impending doom. You might have felt that this morning. But it is all over. <laughs> the doom came, passed over you, and now has moved on. Mm hmm. Well, fortunately, for napping purposes, my lecturers do a, a great job. Um, I've been told I'm the natural cure to all forms of insomnia, so there's that. Well, you know, that's funny, Allison, because like, um, you know, it's not uh, it's not math necessarily. Right. It's not necessarily being able to do the math. It's the interpretation that is kind of the, the big thing there. So, um, you know, it's it's the challenge of it. But I think most of you seem to have gotten the hang of it, which is good. Hey, Aaron. Good afternoon to all of you. Yeah, that one, that test is certainly interesting to write, though. I'm getting some kind of interference on my camera. I'm not sure what that is. Quite possibly a ghost. My power did go out this morning when I was doing another class, and so that was that was not fun to recover from. So I'm assuming either internet internet or power gremlins or something that's affecting the computer. So it's what it is. All right, it's about that time though. So let's go ahead and start the recording, and we can get moving on with our topic of pulmonology. Actually, I did want to share um, an interesting article I read just uh, yesterday. It's from the Journal of Paranormal Investigations. Um, and they were talking about the uh, prevalence of vampires in different areas of the world. And they said, you know, Europe has a very high prevalence of vampires. You know, lots of stories of vampires coming out of Europe. However, there's a relatively low rate of them in Africa. And so the researchers were trying to determine why there was such a low prevalence of vampires in Africa. And so they hypothesizes because vampires you know holy water kills them and so you know they bless the rains down in africa that seems to be taking care of it anywho let us get moving yes but you guys all enjoyed that um anyway so let's get moving on yeah it's a long setup for not necessarily a great joke but that's true they are in new orleans yes Anyway, let's get moving on. So let's talk about some of our pulmonary antibiotics. And I'm just glad most people are getting that, the Toto reference. Um, it's a little bit out of your age gap. To, it's, out, it's out of my age gap as well, but that's okay. Um, interesting. That's true. Very, very true, Kate. 
Uh, anyway, so let's get into our, uh, talking about different pulmonary antibiotics here. We'll talk about the infectious disease stuff, uh, and then depending on how much time we have today, we'll move into talking about um, uh, stuff like asthma and reactive airway disease and whatnot. So uh, first off with bronchitis, uh, certainly we know this is uh, related to inflammation in one or more of the bronchi. And uh, just to mention here, if anything sort of doesn't comport with what was in your uh, medicine course, like just feel free to let me know because... Um, sometimes it's either difference of opinion or source or something like that. And we, I want to make sure that if there are any differences that we can kind of, um, talk about them and try to figure that out. Cause I don't want you all to think that there's like discrepancies between classes, but usually there's some sort of middle ground that can be reached there. So just let me know, but it goes for any of your classes to be honest. But, uh, so anyway, looking at, uh, with bronchitis specifically, certainly it affects, uh, many patients, but especially those who have um, chronic irritation of the lungs, so especially you see things like you know, chronic bronchitis and COPD patients um, for sure. Notice here though that it's not reaching down and infecting the bronchioles and alveoli specifically, that's gonna be more of a pneumonia, which we're gonna talk about shortly. Um, certainly there's a lot of viral causes for this, so certainly things like rhinovirus, influenza, all of that can be causing this. Um, it's when you end up getting either like a primary or secondary bacterial infection, those when we're gonna have a few more treatment options available to us as we'll see here. So things like mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, chlamydia, bordetella. Notice here, these are uh, atypical bacteria we're dealing with at this point. Um, and then also some of the you know upper respiratory bugs we've talked about previously, like streptococcus pneumoniae, homophilus influenza. Even things like staph can sometimes get in uh, and cause a bronchitis. Uh, and you're gonna see there's a lot of crossover in terms of treatment here between pneumonia and bronchitis, but we'll see where the differences lie. Um, again, a lot of these tend to be sort of secondary infections to that initial viral illness, as the case may be. Most of the time, though, these patients, you don't really have to do a whole lot besides supportive care. So if they're having a lot, of, if they're having fever, give them an antipyretic, right? You guys know what to uh, use for that, Tylenol, ibuprofen, etc. cetera. Um, if they are, you know, having cough, then, you know, depending on the situation, you know, if it's a productive cough, it's not necessarily a bad idea for patients to, you know, expectorate that mucus, which may be harboring, you know, organisms. Um, but if it's an annoying cough, you know, things like dextromethorphan may be reasonable there. But certainly have them get good fluid intake because that's going to help them be able to expectorate that stuff when it's ready to come on out. You typically want to avoid things like antihistamines and sympathomimetics. They tend to have more of a drying effect. And so when I say that, I'm talking about things like Benadryl, talking about things like Sudafed, for instance. Um, they dehydrate the bronchial secretions, and that can make those um, secretions more viscous and more difficult to pass there. And, you know, if you're sitting there holding on to those bugs for longer, that may prolong symptoms depending on the situation. If you want to talk about really thick, tenacious secretions. Look at a CF patient, and they have that problem basically their whole life um, where their lungs are just kind of filled up with this really thick, nasty mucus, and it tends to harbor a lot of bacteria. They get colonized with all kinds of things. And so you can think about that. This is sort of being a very mild form of that. Um, so again, stay hydrated, help them to get rid of what's in there. We don't typically um, require antibiotics for a lot of these patients here, and this is a frequent cause for unnecessary antibiotics. So um, patient comes in, cough, mild fever, you know, feel like they have some chest congestion, and then, you know, they leave with a script for a Z-Pack. You know, that's a very common sort of scenario because when patients come to see you, they they want you to do something, right? They, they don't want to just hear, oh, well, you know, just supportive care, take some Tylenol, and I'll see you on your way. They don't want to pay copay just for that, right? So that's a challenge, certainly, and it's a tightrope you, you are all certainly going to have to walk, depending on where you're working at. If the symptom symptoms do are, are if they are persisting, excuse me, for more than five days, that's where you want to start to consider more bacterial involvement, and so you want to focus more so on those atypical bacteria, right? Things like doxycycline, things like your macrolides um, can be useful here. Um, if you find that things like, you know, where you're working at, that there's a high resistance pattern uh, of mycoplasma, for instance, to macrolides, then that's where doxycycline or something in the tetracycline family can be useful there. But I think most people tend to fall back on the macrolides, azithromycin especially, just because of the ease of dosing. You just say, here's a Z-pack, here's five days worth, and then you're kind of done. Um, but again, you don't want to do things just because they're easy. You want to make sure we're taking the best care possible and, and following the, the evidence, right? 
Um, I probably wouldn't re recommend a respiratory fluoroquinolone um, unless they've had some sort of recent antibiotic exposure for whatever reason. Uh, maybe a recent UTI has led to, you know, sort of uh, an opportunistic bronchitis now, or, you know, just due to recent antibiotic exposure. Um, because of this higher risk for more resistant strep pneumo, this is where you can utilize a fluoroquinolone. But for a routine case of bronchitis, I really don't want to see a lot of people prescribing fluoroquinolones because you know, toxicity profile tends to be a bit worse than with the macrolides and, and two resistance is once you get resistant to that, again, there's not a lot of great oral options beyond that, unfortunately, right? So then moving into community acquired pneumonia. Um, now, of course, I'm not going to be getting into the specifics in terms of like diagnosis. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, talking about chest x-rays and stuff, I will tell you that if I can look at a chest x-ray and tell you something's wrong, that means that patient is very, very sick because otherwise I can't really tell heads or tails from, from a lot of that stuff. But again, that's not my job. That's your guys' job, right? But looking at um, pneumonias, you know, this can be a, a pretty uh, sticky wicket in terms of, of treatment. They can be quite challenging, as we'll see here in a little bit. Um, in terms of like where the bacteria are coming from, it can come from a variety of sources here. So for instance, um, if you have patients who have... Um, uh, you guys will get there though. Don't worry, Brian. You'll, you'll, your imaging class starts up pretty soon there. So I might, for like maybe like a day and a half, I'll, I'll know more about x-rays than you guys will, and then you'll far surpass me going at light speed. But anyway, um, looking at um, where these microbes are coming from, some of it could be re related to things like aspiration from the oropharynx. You see this a lot, especially in patients who are more elderly, who may have sort of depressed levels of mentation and they have kind of these micro aspirations that can occur um, that could be one source or if you have inhalation of infectious aerosol someone's coughing in your face and you breathe that in um, a frequent thing we see too especially in really sick patients in the hospital is this hematogenous dissemination so maybe something started out as a uti spread to the bloodstream and then now has made its home in the lungs and, and again, that's where you can see these sort of preceding infections that have nothing to do with the lungs, but now they have a pneumonia and you have to deal with that. Um, that can be uh, certainly something you'll see. And then just things like direct inoculation. So if there's some kind of like penetrating trauma or something, that could be another source as well. The um, how we manage these patients, though, is going to be based on sort of like where were they before they got sick? Um, you know, what are their risk factors for certain types of bacteria? And that's going to help us to guide what, you know, uh, antibiotics we're going to be using for these patients here. So talking about community acquired pneumonia specifically first, and then we'll get into more healthcare associated types of pneumonia. You know, this is community acquired, so they're just out living their lives, doing their thing. They're not in a nursing home. They don't get dialysis three times a week. These are relatively otherwise healthy patients, uh, at least from a, um, you know, they're not visiting a healthcare you know, setting all the time. Um, how you manage these patients too, it depends on just how sick they are, right? Are they sick enough to be admitted or not? You have things like the CURB 65 score and you have all kinds of different scales that can help you decide how you want to manage those patients there. And again, by having sort of an algorithmic approach, it is very helpful because it helps you do the same thing every single time to make sure you're doing really consistent quality of care there. But for uh, outpatient management, we typically don't need to do a lot of diagnostic tests besides, you know, just your confirmatory chest x-ray and whatnot. You don't necessarily have to get cultures for those patients, right? And there's some downsides to getting cultures in a little bit, as we'll see. You can typically do empiric antibiotics, and most patients are going to be fine with just that, especially if they lack a lot of the risk factors we're going to talk about. However, if they're going to be hospitalized, typically you do want to get blood and sputum cultures. And you're like, well, they have a pneumonia. Why am I getting a blood culture? Well, that's because you want to see, was there a hematogenous spread? Is this more widespread than what I thought it was or what I think it is based off of the patient's presentation? Um, it's really important to make sure you get that prior to the antibiotics, right? Um, you don't want to, I can't stress that enough because if you gave the patient antibiotics and then you get the cultures, maybe even 30 minutes, an hour later, if nothing grows, you don't know if it's because there was no bacteria to grow there in the first place, or perhaps if it was the antibiotics that prevented them from growing. But because of that, you want to get cultures first and then do your antibiotics. And typically, this doesn't lead to a very significant delay. You know, if you're in the hospital, you have to order the meds. It takes time for them to be prepared. Your nurses can be working to get the cultures done in the meantime, right? Um, typically when you're looking at a sputum culture, um, the first thing you're going to get reported back usually pretty quickly is the gram stain. And that can be helpful because it will give you at least some idea of what is already present there. 
Um, however, the sputum cultures tend to be notoriously bad for contamination. The reason for that is because, you know, you're not getting what's directly down there in the actual alveoli. The best way to do that would be a bronchial alveolar lavage, but patients usually are intubated when that sort of thing happens and it's much more invasive. So instead you're getting a sputum culture, but frequently that's contaminated with like spit and stuff that's growing in the mouth. Um, and so that may not be what the actual infection is being caused by. Um, so typically if you see like a sputum culture and they note that there's a lot of epithelial cells, typically that's just a, a evidence of spit basically. And so you can't necessarily take a whole lot of stock in that um, as opposed to if you had an actual BAL or something. So looking at the etiology here of CAP, depending on sort of the degree of uh, how sick the patient was and where they sort of got put at based on how sick they were, you can see that the um, spectrum of bacteria changes a little bit and that's going to lead us to have some changes in terms of what antibiotics we're going to be using here. So for outpatients, pretty run-of-the-mill stuff we're kind of used to seeing like strep pneumo, mycoplasma, and ammonia, uh, H influenza, Morxella cateralis, and certainly your respiratory viruses. That makes pretty good sense, you know, especially if any of this stuff started out as like an upper respiratory tract infection and then traveled down, for instance. When you get into inpatient, but maybe not so sick they require the ICU, then you're going to see more atypical bugs like, uh, you know, things like chlamydia, things like Legionella here. And of course, I'm sure all of you know this by now, but if you ever hear any sort of story or a vignette about someone working with an AC unit, just assume it's Legionella and go from there. It's like almost always the case. You'll see that on the boards. You'll see that on every single review you ever do. If someone's messing with an AC, it's Legionella, right? Um, if you guys ever heard the story about where Legionella comes from, but it's kind of an interesting one if you don't know. Um, if the patients are sick enough to be in the ICU, this is where we want to start thinking about things like Staph aureus, and we start to think about things like gram-negative bacilli, so like, you know, E. coli's and proteus and klebsiella's, um, and maybe even things like pseudomonas start to uh, enter into our um, thought process as being causative here, right? So you're going to see the antibiotics will shift based on that as well. Now, some things that may increase risk for patients having more resistant strep pneumo, which will require us to kind of pick up our game a little bit in terms of which antibiotics you're choosing, uh, include some things which may or may not be reversible risk factors here, but certainly when they're sick with an ammonia, you, you know, the risk factors are kind of moot at that point, but it is what it is. So if they are older, so let's say greater than 65, if they've had a beta-lactam within the past three months, that does predispose them to more resistant strep pneumo. Uh, alcoholism or being immunosuppressed sort of for similar reasons, right? Alcoholism tends to have a bit of an immunosuppressant sort of effect there, especially if they're malnourished. Um, comorbidities like diabetes, malignancy, things like that, or if they have exposure to a kid in daycare. So you think about like, you know, grandma comes down with a pneumonia and she's been taking little Johnny to daycare, uh, you know, three times a week, like that could be a significant exposure there because as most of us probably know, daycare centers are little cesspools of resistant bacteria where they keep giving themselves infections back and forth. You know, everyone's getting moxicillin for this, uh, this and that. So it, it breeds resistant bacteria. And so that's why that is a big risk factor for those patients. So what are some risk factors that may predispose someone to an enteric gram negative, right? So this is where we're going to see things like residents in a nursing home, which is going to more speak to more uh, healthcare associated pneumonias of underlying cardiopulmonary disease. So things like, you know, um, you know, asthma or CPD, things like that, other medical comorbidities, and then recent antibiotic exposure. Again, when you have recent antibiotic exposure, you are disrupting the normal flora of the body, and that can predispose patients to have some of these uh, enterogram negative sort of take residence in places they normally shouldn't, like the lungs. Because again, that's normally supposed to be a sterile sort of area. And then pseudomonas, we certainly worry about in cases of they have structural lung disease, if they have corticosteroid use, right? So if you have someone with like rheumatoid arthritis and they've been taking, um, you know, dexamethasone daily for the past year or so, or prednisone, um, again, that's a chronic immunosuppression and that can predispose them to an infection with pseudomonas had broad antibiotic spectrum within the past seven days or so. So if they had like a course of like rocephin or maybe they got some, uh, something even bigger like, you know, a peptazo or cefepime or something, and then mountain nutrition all can put them at risk for pseudomonas. And again, we're going to talk about specifically how we cover for that. And it's a little bit more aggressive than usually what we're used to seeing there. So how do we decide how to manage these patients here? Well, for outpatient management, they're well enough to be able to, you know, walk out of the doors of your ER or, or your urgent care, 
and they have no risk factors for strep pneumo like we talked about before, then a macrolide is kind of your first line agent there. This is a little different for children. Usually you just go with uh, straight amoxicillin because uh, atypical bugs are less likely in that age population. But for adults here, like we're talking, macrolides are fine. Probably azithromycin most commonly, clarithromycin is, is perfectly reasonable there. Then as a second line, if they couldn't tolerate that for whatever reason, a tetracycline like doxy is, is reasonable, okay? If they do have risk factors though, then we need to kind of step up our game a little bit in order to cover for that. So this is where we can utilize something like a beta-lactam plus a macrolide. So your macrolide can be azithromycin and then utilize a beta-lactam like amoxicillin plus or minus clavulonic acid and then something like a second or third generation cephalosporin, uh, either one of these will be fine, right? So you do like azithromycin plus augmentin, or you do cefuroxine plus clarithromycin. Those would be reasonable there. Some cases, especially if you don't have like really big resistance patterns of uh, strep pneumo being resistant to fluoroquinolones, you can utilize a respiratory fluoroquinolone. And when I say that, what I'm talking about mainly is going to be levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. We don't kind of lump Cipro in there necessarily because it has kind of some plus minus coverage or things like pseudomonas, but these two are fine. Um, these might be reasonable if you had a patient who really couldn't tolerate a cephalosporin or a penicillin for whatever reason, maybe due to allergy, you can get away with this. But again, you really gotta check what your res uh, your resistance rates are like in the area um, to see if, you know, if it has, uh, you know, strep pneuma has like, you know, a 70% sensitivity rate, that's not great, right? It means 30% of the time you're gonna be failing therapy because it's resistant. So just something to think about. If they are sick enough to go into the hospital, but not to go to the ICU necessarily, this is where we want to go ahead and make sure that we are covering um, a little more of our bases here in terms of, you know, all those atypicals we talked about, but also things like, you know, some of the enteric bugs we mentioned. So something like cefotraxone or cefotaxime with third generation cephalosporin, or you could use something like high dose ampicillin plus a macrolide. So again, you'd use something like oral azithromycin and probably go with like something like parenteral ceftriaxone or parenteral ampicillin. Most of the time we're going to see we don't do a lot of IV um, macrolides for whatever reason, either due to cost or whatever concerns. We try to stick with oral if we can in those cases there. Or you could do something like doxycycline or you could do something like a fluoroquinolone, right? So especially if they have a beta-lactam allergy. So it's either this combination here which is gonna kinda of cover most of your bases, or if that was not reasonable, doxycycline could be used by itself potentially, or a respiratory fluoroquinolone. Um, I'll tell you, doxy by itself is not frequently done, at least from what I've seen. And again, we like to hold off on fluoroquinolones if we don't need to use them. So this is perfectly reasonable for most patients. And again, compliance is not a concern because they're in the hospital. So as long as the nurses are working and giving them the meds, it's they're fine, right? Um, if they're in the ICU, we'll do the same as above, but typically begin all IV treatment if it makes sense. And then we need to start considering MRSA coverage if warranted. Uh, and of course, we know what we're going to go to as our main treatment for MRSA in the hospital. I think most of you are probably shouting at your screen, vancomycin. And if not, that's what the answer is. So looking at community acquired MRSA pneumonias, we do see increasing incidence in some of these cases here. So you might want to think about this in patients who, for instance, have these like cavitary infiltrates on x-ray without risk for aspiration, so like no history of that. Or if they've recently had influenza, this does put you at a bigger risk for having MRSA. And then if you got that gram stain, that sputum culture, and you saw that there was gram-positive uh, gram coccyte in clusters, that can kind of clue you in there. 99 times out of 100, we're gonna go with vancomycin for coverage for that, right? Um, because it is generally gonna be effective in most cases. It's um, relatively cheap, it's been around for forever. Most people have pretty good comfort working with it. Um, this is where some of you might be, if you're like the admitting hospitalist, you just say one gram Q12 uh, and pharmacy to dose, and then you don't think about it ever again. But depending on where you work, you might not have pharmacy services there available to help you out. So you may need to be able to do this yourself, okay? Otherwise, linazolid may be good. If you have a patient who maybe has like really unstable renal function um, or for whatever reason just could not get vancomycin, then linazolid could potentially be used there. So then uh, switching gears and talking about nosocomial pneumonia, this is going to kind of lump in all of our like ventilator associated pneumonias, healthcare associated, hospital acquired, all that kind of is going to get lumped up here in nosocomial, right? The patient was well, and then they got the infection from us, essentially, maybe not us personally, but from being in the environment. And again, I always mention that hospitals are a terrible place for people to get well. 
because again, the longer you're there, the more at risk you are for medical errors, the longer, more at risk you are for secondary infections. It's not great. And so um, definitely wanna get out of there as fast as you can, if at all possible for your patients. So basically this is an infection of the lung not present at the time of admission, typically uh, greater than 48 hours after hospital admission. Um, if it was there before they got admitted, you probably would have found it within that first 48 hours. And so you can inc uh, include any of these uh, listed here. And this is a pretty common thing you're gonna find, especially up in the ICU, especially in patients who've been ventilated for say greater than a week. And it's probably the second most common nosocomial infection you'll find in hospitalized patients after UTIs. And remember, anytime you have foreign material kind of going into the body, that provides a nice vector for the bacteria to grow and then invade those areas. So if you have a catheter in place, like a Foley catheter, that's providing a spot for those bacteria to grow in the plastic and they can move on up and get into the bladder and the urinary tract. If you're intubating, you have a big endotracheal tube down your throat, that's a good vector for the bacteria to get in there. If you have a line, uh, IV line that's in place for a long time, again, all these things, and this is why infection control is so, so important for these patients here to try to prevent these secondary infections. Because if you were Medicare or Medicaid and this hospital says, hey, you know, we traded this patient for a car wreck, but now they got a hospital acquired pneumonia. Can we get some extra money for that? And they're going to say, well, you, you can go fly a kite. I'm not going to pay for that. You were the ones that led to them having that infection. And so it's a very high cost sort of thing from a hospital system standpoint. And there's also higher mortality for your patients, which is obviously not great. So this is something we want to try to curtail as much as we can. So, sounds like it's raining outside. Uh, hopefully the, uh, the uh, power will stay on. But looking at healthcare associated pneumonias here, we're gonna consider this to be in patients who have been hospitalized in acute care facility for greater than two days in the past 90, right? So healthcare associated. Uh, if they've been in the nursing home or long-term care facility, this is like a super common one you're gonna see in the ER. Very common to have these patients come in, say they've been at the nursing home, no one's been looking in on them for a couple of days, they got dehydrated, now they're here with a rock and pneumonia, renal failure, right? Uh, they've had recent IV antibiotics, chemotherapy, wound care in the previous 30 days, or if they're on hemodialysis. Now, hemodialysis patients as well, because they're constantly going in and having their ports accessed or their fistulas accessed, it's very easy to see how they could have an opportunistic infection kind of getting in and, and causing some problems there. So again, these are all the people you wanna think about as being sort of like healthcare associated. And you need to kind of pick, like kind of put them into a higher risk category for having some of these really resistant bugs or more um, um, nasty bugs like Pseudomonas and MRSA and things like that. So your risk factors um, can also factor into this as well. So some being unmodifiable, some being modifiable. So for instance here, um, age, you know, chronic lung disease, uh, aspiration, all these things here, we can't really do a whole lot about necessarily, but the modifiable ones we can certainly try to affect. So any time, again, they have some sort of foreign material going into the body, usually some sort of plastic, um, they're mechanically ventilated, the ET tube, they have an NG tube in place, if they have an ICP monitor. Now, again, this is not to monitor for clowns who've invaded um, the ward. This is actually for intracranial pressure, if anyone was curious. Although sometimes you may find clowns in the PICU, for instance, coming by to do their, their little therapy time. But regardless, um, other things, so if you can get those out, if it's clinically relevant, then then you won't, can try to do that. But otherwise, um, you know, you may kind of be just stuck with that in place and have to deal with it. Um, the other thing too, which is not something a lot of people think about is the use of H2 blockers or antacid therapy. So we haven't talked about this. We'll get to it in, in, um, in GI next semester, but H2 blockers basically prevent histamine from activating the um, receptors that cause stomach acid to be produced or some of the receptors, right? So we have histamine receptors in the stomach and when activated, they cause stomach acid to be produced here. So one of the big things to think about with patients, especially those in the ICU who are critically ill, maybe intubated for instance, is you have to worry about stress ulcers that can develop here because their body is in, under an incredible amount of stress. They're producing a ton of cortisol. Perhaps they're also on um, anti-inflammatories like dexamethasone or something like that that's suppressing um, the production of things like prostaglandins and whatnot, you need to have those there because if you don't have those prostaglandins, they can't form that protective barrier around the stomach. And otherwise, if you lose that, then you just start to chew through and that's where you get an ulcer. So to prevent those stress ulcers, then you wanna go ahead and give them something that will block the production of stomach acid. So either an H2 blocker, proton pump inhibitor, or maybe even an antacid. That's all well and good, right? Because you want to prevent 
them from developing a stomach ulcer as a result of their critical illness. So that's great. The downside, though, is that normally the stomach being at a pH of 2 is relatively sterile because a lot of bacteria can't grow in that environment, maybe besides H. pylori, for instance. But what happens is, is if you have the pH of the stomach being chronically higher than normal, bacteria can start to produce there, and they can get these little micro aspirations from the esophagus into the respiratory tract, and that can lead them to develop a secondary pneumonia, especially if they have an endotracheal tube there into the respiratory tract. So again, it's a double-edged sword for a lot of this stuff. This is why good like um, oral care can help to prevent that. So you'll see that in a lot of times for patients who are intubated, they'll have sort of a, uh, a bundle of things that they need in addition to, um, you know, stress ulcer prophylaxis, they'll have DVT prophylaxis, they'll have oral care because you want to make sure that you can clean out the mouth and prevent bacteria from causing another infection. So a lot of things you'll see there in the ICU that are as a result of the fact they have to be intubated and they can't breathe on their own, right? So in terms of etiology here, the gram-negative bacilli, um, you know, things like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that's one we're really, really concerned with. If we're covering for that, chances are we're covering for all these other gram-negative bacilli. E. coli, Klebsiella, all that stuff is typically going to be covered there. Then you got to start thinking about gram-positive cocci like MRSA, certainly things like strep pneumo, but guess what? If you're covering for MRSA, you're probably covering for strep pneumo too. And then you even have to consider, okay, well, you know, patient's been on broad spectrum antibiotics for, you know, three days, five days, white count's still high, the fever's still going, they're not improving. And then you got to start thinking about things like, you know, fungal pathogens, maybe a certain thing about acid fast bacilli. These things start to come up in your differential if the patients are not improving with antibiotics alone. So typically for these patients here, you want to start therapy as soon as possible. You don't want to wait on a definitive culture. So you get the culture first, right? You get the swab done, you start the patient antibiotics, and then you start them off on pyrrhic antibiotics, so stuff that's likely to get kind of everything almost. And then you wait for the cultures to come back. And at that point, then you can scale down therapy. You know, if they were on three medications for a nosocomial pneumonia, which is common, and they come back and it's MRSA, then you can get rid of all the other stuff. Right, so we'll look at some examples of that here in a minute. Um, so we're doing broad spectrum antibiotics, considering multi-drug resistant pathogens, right? So things that are likely to be resistant to most of our common drugs. You gotta cover for MRSA and pseudomonas, okay? And then once we have cultures back, then we streamline therapy. So looking at this, just a kind of brief algorithm here. So if you have hospital acquired, ventilator associated, healthcare associated, pneumonia suspected, um, you want to think about do they have high risk for broad, you know, multi-drug resistant pathogens? So if they have prior antibiotics, if it's late onset, so more than five days or so, if they're on immunosuppressive therapy, all these things would lead you to choosing more broad spectrum initial therapy versus a little bit more limited spectrum. So I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. So if they don't have any risk factors for MDR pathogens, that's where we're going to consider using our third gen cephalosporin. So typically something like ceftriaxone is going to be pretty good for a lot of those cases there. It won't cover the atypical bugs, though. If you recall, third-gen cephalosporins don't cover atypicals. If that's what you're concerned about, then you can utilize something like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, some sort of uh, respiratory fluoroquinolone is reasonable there. Other alternatives could be something like ampicillin sulbactam, which would be good if because it, it has uh, anaerobic coverage if you thought there was an aspiration pneumonia that was actually legit. I'll tell you, though, a lot of aspiration pneumonias people think they have is not true. Um, problem with that is if you have someone who like vomited and now it looks like they have a pneumonia and they have a bunch of fluffy stuff on their chest x-ray, um, chances are it's actually due to a chemical pneumonitis. Having stomach acid in your lungs will cause injury just like a bacteria can. And so frequently you'll find that um, it's not true infection, not true a anaerobic infection. It's just an irritation due to stomach acid and other stuff getting down into the lungs. And then you could use something like a narrow spectrum carbapenem like ertapenem, but more often than not, your patients are going to have some sort of risk factor for one of these MDR pathogens here, especially if they're really sick in the ICU, they're coming from the nursing home, or they're coming from the dialysis center, wherever the case may be. This is where we're going to need to kind of go with the full court press in terms of antibiotics. So our gram-negative therapy, remember we're covering for pseudomonas, so we're going for two drugs here, okay? We're going to want some sort of beta-lactam, and then we want a drug with a different mechanism, okay? So this means we can either use an anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin, carbapenem or penicillin. Any one of these would be reasonable, plus either an antipsudomonal fluoroquinolone. Typically, levofloxacin is most common, occasionally Cipro, but I'll tell you what, more often than not, it's levofloxacin or an aminoglycoside, gentamicin, tobramycin, all that. I'll cover these in a little more detail in just a moment here. But you want this combination here, 
both of these categories being represented here for the pseudomonal coverage for the gram negative coverage okay then you're going to want something for gram positive coverage this is nine times out of ten probably 99 times out of 100 vancomycin okay so it'll be on vancomycin plus a beta lactam plus an aminoglycoside or fluoroquinolone those three are going to be able to get mrsa pseudomonas and kind of everything else that falls under those gram negative and positive umbrellas there um very broad coverage right and again, you want them to be off of that as soon as possible. So once those cultures come back, and you know what it is, then you scale down therapy because the longer they're on this really broad spectrum antibiotics means they're more likely to get secondary infections. They're more likely to get C. diff, all kinds of bad things that can happen. Organ toxicity from the drugs, all sorts of things. So let's look at a few of uh, the representative uh, uh, examples of these different classes here. So with our anti-pseudomonal cephalosporins, there is ceftazidine, but we don't use that too frequently. It's very um, uh, likely to get resistance uh, developed to it very quickly. So we use cefepime. So cefepime is the one out of this category here. I'm going to talk a lot about renal dose adjustment here and mention it quite frequently. The majority of the drugs we're talking about do require renal adjustment. Now, why does that matter? Because a lot of times these patients are snicker, sicker than snot. Snicker than snot. Um, sicker than snot, meaning that they're coming in and they are, um, you know, maybe in total septic shock. Maybe they're hypotensive. They're underperfusing uh, their organs, especially the kidneys, and that can lead to some very unpredictable kidney function. And these patients' renal function can change from day to day, hour to hour in some instances. So you have to watch for this and make sure that patients aren't going to start accumulating this stuff, and they uh, can lead to some organ toxicity. So this is like one of the big places that you'll see pharmacists working like in ICUs, for instance, is to kind of go through a patient's profile, look at their labs from day to day and see how do we need to adjust this stuff. And there's a lot of, the, I mean, when I did my rotations there, I probably did between probably like five and six ICU rotations during my two-year fellowship. Um, and that was like the majority of the recommendations I was just making. It's just renal dose adjustment because it comes up so frequently and a lot of providers aren't, they don't keep that in the front of your mind necessarily, which is why Again, again, interprofessional care is really important. You're getting a lot of different people all in on, on the same problem to kind of, you know, more heads are better than one as it turns out, right? Um, looking at anti-pseudomonal carbapenems. Uh, remember, imipenem psilostatin, it does fit the bill here, but you do want to avoid this in patients with seizure history because, again, poor kidney function, they can accumulate imipenem, and that can lead to seizure. So you don't want to cause that problem on top of, you know, the pneumonia the patient's dealing with. Um, I, probably due to that fact, I've seen most hospitals I've ever worked at uh, have meropenem uh, on their formulary, so less rest for seizures there, probably a safer med altogether. Um, don't use erdipenem here because it does not cover pseudomonas, so one thing to note. And again, these all require renal dose adjustment. Next, for um, the anti-pseudomonal um, penicillins, I don't really ever see ticrocillin. I didn't even mention I don't think in um in your lecture beforehand just because it doesn't really get used all that often but it definitely piperacillin tazobactam is the one to want you to know from this category because this is the one you're going to see far and away the most common remember the additional benefit of piptazo over something like cefepime is that this has better or has anaerobic coverage so if you really thought that there could be an anaerobe causing infection then this would be something you definitely would want to consider using as opposed to something like cefepime um, remember, your carbapenems will also get good anaerobic coverage as well. So meropenem, piperacillin, tazobactam, either of those would be perfectly reasonable if that was a concern. And then looking at our uh, so anti-pseudomonal fluoroquinolones, this typically includes things like Cipro and then levofloxacin. I probably see more levofloxacin being used than anything else. And again, this is good because it provides coverage against your atypicals, mycoplasma, etc. Those have good lung tissue penetration. And this is the challenge you're going to find with certain antibiotics is is that certain ones can penetrate certain areas of the body better than others. So for instance, like if you had a patient with meningitis, cephalosporins cross the blood brain barrier very easily, right? Due to the size and the, um, the physiochemical properties of the drug, they just cross over easily. A lot of things are very difficult to use in the lungs because they have poor penetration here. Fluoroquinolones have good penetration, which is handy. I'll show you another example of that in just a moment with something like vancomycin. However, um, the problem is that their increasing use does lead to more resistance, and so you want to be very judicious about whipping these out. Um, typically, I see a lot of people end up going with the aminoglycoside over the fluoroquinolone in a lot of cases there. And again, these require renal dose adjustment. The aminoglycosides are going to be gent, tobra, and amicacin. Again, we will use typically, um, we're going to utilize their um, concentration-dependent killing abilities, usually give a really big dose one time daily, and that allows us to get very high concentrations. It'll kill off a lot of the bacteria, get better lung penetration, right? So you have a bigger dose, get a higher concentration, that will translate into the lungs. 
and then um, you'll give it one time a day typically, and then uh, that prevents accumulation, which can lead to the organ toxicity we've talked about before, odo and, and nephrotoxicity. Um, and again, that's the thing we wanna watch for. So again, using therapeutic drug monitoring is really important for things like the aminoglycosides and vancomycin because by following those levels, not only can we one tell if they're gonna be efficacious, like in the term, in uh, the case of vancomycin, but also we want to prevent further organ toxicity. Because again, if you fry the patient's uh, kidneys because they're hypotensive and weren't perfusing very well and you weren't watching their aminoglycoside uh, levels and they were accumulating, causing further kidney injury, no one's going to want to pay you for that. Insurance doesn't want to pay for that. That was your fault for not following that more closely. And so that can become a big challenge. All right. So then switching gears to vancomycin, obviously this is for our MRSA coverage. Now vancomycin is a very large molecule. If you look at the uh, picture of its structure, it has a hard time penetrating a lot of tissues. And so this is why we have to actually go with more aggressive dosing for something like vancomycin. Uh, if you recall, we talked about how we measure trough levels. The one determine if we're keeping the drug level above the MIC for efficacy purposes, and then also we're not getting levels too high, which may predispose to toxicity. So similarly, odo and nephrotoxicity, like we saw with the aminoglycosides. And so um, this is something where you want to make sure that we're using higher levels. So we actually shoot for a higher trough in this case here. I don't, I don't care that you know the number specifically, but um, as an example with... Um, if you had something like a bacteremia, it's relatively easy to get the drug to the site of infection, which is the blood. Um, you know, we shoot for like a trough of like 10 to 15. For something like meningitis or something like um, pneumonia, which is shoot even higher than that, like 15 to 20. That way we know that that's translating to higher lung penetration. And we know that that means we get better coverage for those bacteria there. So um, very handy to use there. Again, therapeutic drug monitoring has to be used with this drug, just like with the aminoglycosides. Now, Zyvox would be uh, handy, but you want to hold off on using this unless patients have a really good indication for it. Like uh, say those cultures come back and it's vancomycin resistant enterococcus or vancomycin resistant staph aureus. This is where linazolid really comes into play here, but it's really easy to use. It's like, you know, 600 Q12 and like, that's all the dosing you need to know about it. Cause there's no organ adjustment. Um, but that means it's easy to use. People want to use it. So this is typically um, uh, restricted in the hospital. You usually can't get a hold of this unless you have some sort of approval from like an infectious disease provider. And that may sound kind of like odd. You may think like, well, I'm the prescriber. I should be able to get whatever I want because I think it's best for my patient. Um, but you're going to find, in, especially with antibiotics, that uh, antimicrobial stewardship is really important that we not overuse certain things um, and try to prevent resistance if possible. And so you may order a drug and then all of a sudden you have the pharmacist call and you say, hey, um, just checking in on this. Um, do you have approval from anyone for this? And you're like, well, I'm the approval. And you're like, well, not really because this is a restricted antibiotic and you have to have approval from an infectious disease provider and whatnot. So sometimes you run into problems like that. And, and certainly in linazolid, something I like to hold off on unless we have a really good reason to use it. All right. So those are the typical meds you're going to be using for more, um, you know, healthcare associated nosocomial pneumonia, especially with the really resistant, um, multi-drug resistant pathogens here. What happens once you get your cultures back? Well, you can then start to scale back your antibiotic coverage. So if they're just growing MRSA, I probably don't need anything to cover for gram negatives at that point, right? So it's okay to scale back. And especially if the patient is clinically improving, their fever's coming down, white count's coming down, uh, hemodynamically they're improving, that's good to do. And then when possible, if they're stable enough, then you can switch over to PO therapy because it's cheap, cheaper. Um, if you can discontinue some of those intravenous lines that helps prevent infection, all those things are really helpful, okay? In terms of failure of therapy, so what happens if you've been treating for like three or five days and patient's just not improving, they're getting more hypotensive, their fever is still high, their white count's up, their inflammatory markers are up, what can we think about? Well, one, it could be wrong therapy. So the bugs that are growing may be resistant, or maybe we didn't choose the uh, adequate antimicrobial therapy in the first place. Maybe we thought they didn't really have any um, uh, risk factors for MDR pathogens, and so we just went with like a fluoroquinolone. Well, really, we should have expanded it out to think about MRSA, right? It would be a wrong diagnosis too. Not everything um, that you think is pneumonia happens to be the case. Maybe it's a cancer, maybe it's a PE or something, right? It could have a typical presentation of other things here. Or, and then you think about complications too, like lung abscesses or C. difficile colitis, all these things can, can occur here. So typically uh, treatment times around a week or so, and then even longer if you have some of these really nasty gram-negative bugs like stenotrophomonas, maltophilia, uh, pseudomonas, acinetobacter, and things like that.
So that's it for the pneumonia talk. Now I want to switch gears here and get in into uh, tuberculosis, but I think there's some questions. I'm going to answer those real briefly here. So uh, let's see, do we need to know all of the bacterial etiology for different conditions? Um, not necessarily. I'm not going to ask you specifically, you know, which bacteria is most likely to be causing infection in this patient. However, I may say something like, um, you know, a patient comes in, have these risk factors, they're going to the ICU, or maybe they've been in the ICU for a week and they've been intubated that whole time. You know, which antibiotics do you think are most appropriate to cover for this patient suspected pneumonia, right? Um, or for instance, I might ask, you know, a patient's culture comes back and they're growing out uh, MRSA, what's the most appropriate treatment at this time? Or I may make it something like, you know, pseudomonas or something like that. That's what I'm going to be more asking questions about. I'm not going to ask you specifically, um, do you think this patient has mycoplasma or Legionella or MRSA? Like that, that's not really um, my my scope of things in this class here. Uh, would you avoid doxycycline and minocycline in kids under eight and pregnant women, or is that a contraindication only for tetracycline? Um, so that contraindication applies to all of the tetracyclines. It's just confusing because the category is tetracyclines, and also one of the members of that category is tetracycline. That's confusing. I agree. Um, however, uh, you know, think about pregnant women, typically second, third trimesters where that's going to be more of a, co a contraindication. And then for kids, if it's like a short course, they've actually found that it's like less of a huge risk in terms of like, you know, teeth staining and things like that. This would be more if they're on it, like, um, you know, for longer times, like, you know, weeks and weeks potentially, uh, which is less likely to occur. Um, you know, so would it be my first choice for like a six year old? Probably not. It might go something else. But uh, then again, the bacteria that are likely to cause pneumonia in a child are a little different than that would be for an adult. You see less um, a likelihood of atypical pathogens in a, a child than you do in an adult patient or even adolescent for that matter. And so that's why you typically go with more like beta lactams, for instance, like amoxicillin. I dose amoxicillin is actually like the go-to choice for pediatric pneumonia, um, you know, depending on some other risk factors too. But that's that's kind of my two cents on that. All right. Someone says, does starting an antibiotic before having definitive culture results and then switching treatment once culture results are received have anything to do with developing resistance? Like how they say you shouldn't stop an antibiotic course until it's fully completed. That's a good question. So um, remember that uh, when you say you have a patient who's taking, uh, you give them like, you know, seven days of an antibiotic, you're going home and they feel good after three days. And so they stop taking it, right? They haven't fully eradicated that infection. That bacteria may still be there. And when it comes back, it may uh, be selecting out for more resistant uh, varieties of itself. And thus you get resistant bacterial growth, right? On the other hand, though, say you have a patient who's in the hospital uh, and you can have one of two scenarios. So one of which says you maybe you go at the full court press in the ICU you're doing Vanco, Gentamicin and Cefepime, right? So you got all three of those drugs there. And the thing comes back and it says, oh, actually, it's MSSA. You've still been covering for that bacteria uh, this whole time. Vanco still works for that, but now you can scale it back to something like dicloxacillin or nafcillin, and you still have continuity of coverage there. So it doesn't really lead to more resistance because you now scaled it back. Now, does that mean the patient's not at risk for like secondary infections like C. diff? Not necessarily because you were going with broad spectrum drugs for you know a couple of days there. Um, the other hand though, would be if you were treating for something and you actually didn't cover for it in the first place, right? So if you were say just treating with, um, say for instance, like you were just giving ceftriaxone to a patient and then the cultures come back and it's MRSA and you weren't expecting that you've never really been covering for that bug in the first place. And so by switching over to something like Vanco, now you're adequately treating the patient at that point. And so resistance is less of a concern there as well. So um, not quite the same concept there, but I think it's a good point to delineate there. So I'm glad you asked that question because I'm sure other people may have been thinking sort of the same thing as well. All right. No other questions from the peanut gallery. So let me switch back over and we can go and talk about our tuberculosis, right? So what is tuberculosis, right? And it was this acid fast um, uh, bacilli that's going to be growing here. You guys have already covered this in uh, Palm, as far as I know. And so we're going to see that this has to be treated very differently than something like a strict pneumonia because this is a very slow growing sort of organism here. And that is really um, a negative thing. Normally, we like things to be growing quickly. 
quickly replicating so that way when we disrupt that by affecting his DNA or its cell wall, it quickly dies off. That's not necessarily going to be the case here with uh, uh, tuberculosis as we're going to see here. And so here's just a picture looking at some of the different places our different drugs might be working at. Most of these are going to be new for us. So um, other things that kind of makes it a little bit more difficult to manage as well includes it has this, this kind of waxy cell coat, this mycolic acid layer that makes it more difficult for uh, things to sort of penetrate through as you're going to see there. And so it's very slow growing, maybe dormant for long, long periods of time there, as you know. And again, Antimicrobials that affect cell division. So if I was affecting things like, um, you know, uh, you know, DNA unwinding and rewinding, topoisomerase, and you know, things like that, it, it's not going to be as effective. It can still work, but it just won't be as effective as if it was really quickly growing sort of thing. There, there are other types of mycoplasma we may, may be dealing with here, like abscesses and uh, fortitum. But you know, we're we're mainly going to focus on M tuberculosis here, um, as that's what kind of we have the most information about. Um, other ones you may run into too include things like leprosy, uh, which can be caused by Mycobacterium leprae. Um, this one is particularly of concern for patients with like HIV or chronic immunosuppression. So Mycobacterium avium complex, you hear about MAC, that's usually what we're referring to there. Um, a lot, lots of different varieties. I'm mainly just going to be focused on M tuberculosis here. Although there is some crossover, some cross sensitivity here between these different varieties. So looking at treatment, I'm going to get into the individual drugs here in just a moment. Notice how the treatment times are quite long, you know, two months um, of initial therapy with a four, uh, four drug regimen like isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, followed by four months of just isoniazid and rifampin. Again, I don't care if you know the dosing necessarily, um, but this is a really difficult thing to treat because you think about who your typical TB patients, right? They may have very unstable social, um, you know, social supports. At home, they may not have a permanent address, maybe homeless, they may be, um, you know, IV drug abusers, they may be all kinds of things that will lead them to be, um, you know, make compliance very difficult, right? Either by just nature of their, you know, social stat or social situations or whatever the case may be. So that being said, it becomes a challenge because you have to treat for so long. I mean, it's tough enough for people even to take antibiotics for a week, much less six months worth of therapy. Um, these patients are easy to lose to follow up. As it turns out, um, you may find that that will then lead to uh, cases of resistance. And especially if you look at the literature, there's a lot of cases of resistant TB, especially in, in homeless patients, just due to the fact that they, they will start a regimen, it will be going good for a little while, and then they kind of fall off the wagon a little bit. And so it's a really, really big challenge in that patient population, which is unfortunate they don't really have more support to help out with that, right? Even in some cases, though, you're going to find... Um, yeah, that was for that was for active TB. We can talk about latent a little bit later on there. Um, I'm going to be more focusing on the drug specifics. So for this section here, I'm not going to ask you necessarily like what is the most appropriate treatment duration for this type of uh, TB. I'm going to be more focusing on the drugs because that's the new thing we're covering uh, here, right? So mechanism, side effects, drug interactions, etc. Um, so and again, the treatment time maybe even more prolonged than just that six to nine months I mentioned before. Like, you know, if you have HIV, because you, uh, if you're sick enough with HIV to develop TB, that shows a degree of immunosuppression to where they're going to require even longer treatments to make sure they get rid of that. Um, so it can be quite challenging for these patients here. Um, and we don't like to kind of cut corners with this. We want to make sure we're using full therapy because that does lead to resistance. So let's cover the drugs here. Um, first off, we have isoniazid. This is a uh, bacteriostatic. could be used for latent um, a TB or maybe used for more active uh, treatment as well. And um, so it'll if it's in the latent phase, it'll be more bacteriostatic, kind of preventing it from replicating. Um, if they're actively dividing, this is where it becomes more, more bactericidal. And this is working mainly by inhibiting the, uh, the waxy cell coat, okay? So it'll help to dis um, disrupt that mycolic acid um, uh, layer and allow, especially for other drugs, to be able to penetrate and get in even better to work, that much better. Um, let's see, is this required to be reported to public health on diagnosis? Uh, I believe TB is, I'm pretty sure on that one. And if you want, you can actually look to either the Florida Department of Health or the CDC, and they'll have a list of disease states that are um, mandatory reporting, and I'm fairly certain TB is on that list. I just haven't looked at it in a while. Um, so you're going to see here that, um, you know, some of the challenges that comes up from this. And again, I was you know, try to answer questions like that. If I'm not sure, look it up, you know, so go to the, the main sources there, but um, that can always be, be helpful. 
So um, with Ice and Isa, though, it typically it remains has pretty good activity here, but you can see resistance that can develop over time. Like for instance, um, the the mycoplasm, mycoplasm could end up destroying the cell by developing new uh, enzymes. It could do this, right? Uh, Matt's asking if we have someone who comes into an urgent care with TB by the time we figure it uh, TB didn't they spread it to everyone including us yeah so there is contact concerns there um, so there's what they call like post exposure prophylaxis which you I'm probably not going to get into in these slides here but um, that is a concern so for instance if you have a patient who su suspect as TB like they'll be put into what they call a negative pressure room what that means is basically it'll be a room in which it kind of acts as a vacuum. It's sucking air from outside of the room in, so that way it does not expel particles from inside the room back out. But certainly, like, you know, the nurse at triage who initially had contact with the patient, the um, the techs, the nurses, the provider who was in contact with the patient before they knew that it was TB, they would all be sort of like doing that contact tracing that's been kind of in the news lately. Um, they would do that to see who could have had exposure and then they could have uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, right? Which would be a certain course of um, a couple of drugs there, which again, I'd have to look it up to be to get the full regimen. I don't want to tell you anything wrong, but but what you'll see is that you can develop resistance to these bugs. And just here's just a few examples of how that can actually occur there. Um, now for isoniser for prophylactic use, which in this case for like PEP, you could use it for something like that or post-exposure prophylaxis. It could be used alone potentially, but for active disease, you're typically using combination therapy here. Now, um, in terms of adverse effects, there's a lot to go with this one. So you want to be really careful with, um, with this drug because it can be problematic, as we'll see here. See, Marley is asking random question, but why, especially in the ER, are all rooms not negative pressure rooms? We only had that five or six in my ER make COVID precautions 100% more or 100 times more difficult. I agree. Um, it is more uh, it is more difficult from a uh, logistics sort of like facilities sort of setting. It is um, requires more. Um, there's a lot, a lot of like you know duct work and HVAC work they have to do to to keep those negative pressures, um, keep the pressures negative, I should say. Um, I only know so much, uh, as, as much as I do about this because one of the things I did back at Nemours was helping with some of the renovations that we did for, um, uh, some of the renovations we did for the IV room. So typically like in a hospital pharmacy, you'll have like the normal IV room where everything is kept very sterile, but it's a normal pressure room. Uh, but then there's a hazardous room where we do like all the chemo and stuff. And just like with TB, we don't want those particles getting out for people to breathe in. We do the same thing for hazardous drugs like chemo because we don't want people to breathe that stuff in. It can cause cancer potentially. So we have a negative pressure room just for that. And it's typically much smaller because if you think about the volume of air you're having to suck out of that room to keep the pressures negative, it becomes quite challenging, a lot more um, uh a lot bigger of a logistical challenge than what it might seem like. So it's a good idea. It's just like, you know, the airplane black box is like the only thing that survived was a black box. Well, why not make the whole plane out of the black box? Probably not as simple as that. So it certainly does make things challenging in cases of a pandemic as it turns out. So hopefully that sort of answers your question. Uh, it's certainly outside of my scope a little bit, but, you know, uh, I think it sort of answers it. So anyway, so with isoniazid, so we, um, if you look back here, you notice here that it is uh, metabolized by acetylation, right? That should kind of clue you into something because we've seen this a few times already. We saw hydralazine, we saw procainamide, now we have isoniazid. We have three drugs now we've talked about that undergo acetylation. And what does that mean? Remember that if you have slow acetylators, they build up levels of the drug, which can lead to problems. In this case here, you still see that lupus-like syndrome, right? So another unique drug that has that. For fast acetylators, it may not work as well. You can actually have levels drop down too low and be less effective. Uh, Alyssa was saying we had a patient with suspected TB at my old job and had to wear the Capper uh, spaceship looking helmet mask. Yeah, I, did, I had to have my mask fitting recently for N95 and I was a little too scruffy for the thing. So I got the cool like Star Wars rebel looking helmet on. It was pretty sweet. Um, other things you're going to run into the ice and eyes that it is pretty rough on the liver. And think about like who, what type of patients are you treating for, for TB, right? Um, a lot of these homeless patients, they also have concomitant substance abuse disorders, right? And so you can see the alcoholics tend to have a worse time from this uh, with a, uh, from a hepatic standpoint and with increasing age, this is also a problem. So you gotta watch your liver function test. Also peripheral neuritis is a problem. And this has to do with the fact that isoniazid can cause a pyridoxine deficiency. There's a specific enzyme it actually affects that can uh, lead to this. So you always wanna give Concomitant pyridoxine or vitamin B6 along with isoniazid. That's has to, that's a, a must, right? 
Um, what's actually really interesting too, though, is that um, uh, isoniazid itself can cause seizures. And the reason why that happens is, is because it depletes that pyridoxine, your body cannot convert glutamate, or your brain can't convert glutamate over into GABA. And we'll talk about this next semester in terms of um, the uh, you know neurotransmitters and stuff like that. But remember, glutamate's a really excitatory neurotransmitter, and GABA is a very inhibitory. It's the the gas and the brakes on your car, retro, uh, respectively. And so what you find is is that if you prevent the conversion of glutamate into GABA, you have way too much excitation. It can lead to seizures. And that's actually a big thing I see for someone who is overdosed on isoniazid potentially. We got to really watch out for that. And it's also what leads to a lot of those um, uh, neuritis. So we, uh, sometimes we actually even give, if you think about a normal dose of pyridoxine, be like 100 milligrams, 50 milligrams, those patients there with seizure due to isoniazid, we give five grams. So it's a really huge dose we're giving there to try to get the GABA levels back up there. It can be really, really tough. But sort of on the lesser side of that scale there, there's also, um, you know, some patients like, they get a little bit of euphoric effect from it. I don't know how often that is. Um, but you can also see some issues like psychosis or memory impairment. I was obviously memory impaired to add a comma in there. Um, so, you know, lots of seeing that's effects you can see from this drug as well. Okay. Now, rifampin is also kind of a new one um, that we haven't talked about previously, but this is going to be um, sort of, uh, it's actually derived from a different type of bacteria, the streptomyces, um, that actually developed it as sort of like its own natural antibiotic to kind of keep other stuff from growing on it or near it. And so it's pretty broad spectrum, and you see it sometimes used for things like endocarditis. Um, you can see it used for MRSA potentially. Usually, though, this is going to be like an add-on. It's used in conjunction with other stuff typically. You won't usually see it by itself. And so basically it works by inhibiting this RNA polymerase. And so it's going to be complex when the enzyme and has pretty specific uh, activity against, you know, TB in this case here, um, in order to prevent it from replicating and producing new proteins, right? And so by doing that, you can help to limit the growth of the, the bacterium. And so you don't use it by itself though, because it develops really rapid tolerance. And so normally you start up other drugs along with this, to try to prevent that from occurring here. And you typically see this most commonly being used for TB, uh, either as a prophylactic, or you may see it potentially, I'm sorry, for meningococcal disease, you may see it used as a prophylactic. It's kind of more of an old school thing or endocarditis. So here's the big thing with rifampin. Again, all these drugs here for TB kind of have a very unique sort of thing associated with them that you want to know about. Um, so with rifampin here, this is a CYP enzyme inducer, right? So not an inhibitor. We mostly just talked about inhibitors. In the past, this is an inducer. So not only does it affect 3A4, which is huge, but it can also affect 2C9, 1A2, which means it can affect anticoagulants like warfarin. So now all of a sudden your warfarin is being metabolized at a faster rate, so levels drop. And guess what? Your INR also drops back down to one. So you can see more risk for clots. It can affect things like contraceptives. So if you had someone who was on an estrogen-based contraceptive, they may increase metabolism of that, leading to lower levels and thus risk for ovulation. In fact, all kinds of drugs. You gotta be really careful with this one. Make sure you do your inter interaction checkers. But guess what? A lot of these patients, or some of them, may also have concomitant HIV. And HIV has a lot of medications that are metabolized through CYP3A4. And so this can be a big problem because sure, you're treating their TB, but now their HIV is not being controlled because the levels are of those drugs are too low and thus HIV is now growing unchecked. Very challenging with these patients here. So again, this is why people go and do ID specifically and they work just in this field because it can be so challenging. Um, also see some uh, liver effects here. Again, sometimes it's tough to tell. Was it the isoniazid? Is it the rifampin? Hard to say. However, this does change the color of your secretion. So this is another unique thing. If you ever see a, a, a vial of rifampin or a bag of it, um, it is like, looks like wine almost. Like it's very, very dark red. Um, and so this can cause sort of an orange discoloration of your tears, your sweat. Um, you have the patient who's like laying in bed, they get up and they've been kind of sweating a bit and you'll see this kind of orange stain left behind. The urine will turn bright orange. Um, this can be troubling because they think that something is wrong if they were not warned about this. So um, and one of my caveats I always tell students is if anything changes the color of your urine or your poop, you want to let people know about that because that can be really concerning. All of a sudden you have orange pinkish looking urine, you may think you're bleeding. If something turns your stool black, you may think you're bleeding. So um, these are things you want to let people know about beforehand because otherwise it can be kind of scary. So um, you can have some degree of hypersensitivity to rifampin as well, cause like kind of flu-like syndromes, about a fifth of patients out there, and certainly GI disturbances. So pretty not great from a side effect profile, but is useful as an add-on to some of these other meds for TB.
Uh, next of the thambutol, this one is going to be working again by inh inhibiting that mycolic acid incorporation. So again, affecting the cell wall kind of at the same time that isoniazid is. Uh, and so again, it helps to weaken the cell wall. So other agents like rifampin will have better penetration into the actual cell itself. Uh, Isabel saying there was a young girl with severe acne that failed all other antibiotics and was too young for isotretinoin. So the doc prescribed rifampin. She started crying and her tears were orange, right? I'd probably think I was like in the like a superhero origin movie if someone started crying orange tears. But yeah, it's pretty wild uh, if you see that sort of thing. And if you weren't prepared for it, then it might kind of spook you as well. So uh, Thambutol does have to be renally dose adjusted. So you want to watch out for that for those patients there. Uh, and again, using it in combination with other things because if not if used by itself, it does develop resistance pretty pretty quickly there. The unique thing with Thambutol is actually the visual disturbance is here. You see this kind of more in adults, um, but basically they have a trouble with red green discoloration or discrimination and they have overall decreased visual acuity. And so again, this would be something we wanna check visual acuity kind of baseline and make sure you're following this and you may need to DC the drug depending on kind of what what's happening with that if it's kind of going in, in the wrong direction there. Um, I thought the, the red green discrimination is kind of a very unique thing to Thambutol. Probably come up like on your boards or something. Um, finally, we have pyrazinamide. This is actually kind of interesting because it gets converted over to pyrazinic acid, which lowers the pH uh, such that the bacteria can't really grow. And at that point, with it being inhibited, it can then enter the macrophages and be destroyed by that means. Um, this is nice because if you add it on to therapy, it usually kind of limits the length of duration of treatment, which is beneficial. And so um, you may only get for two months or so, though, because it will help to shorten duration of treatment, but will lead to um, liver toxicity if used for too long. So we kind of limit it from that standpoint there. Uh, Shelby's asking, can the visual disturbances be reversed once they're taken off the drug? My understanding is that, yes, it typically is reversible, but that's why you want to catch it early. Um, so that way, if you're seeing especially the visual acuity kind of going in the wrong direction, you can DC the drug early if possible. Um, but it's, there may be some cases where that's going to be not reversible. So it just really depends. And again, if you talk to someone who um, dealt with this on a more case or more routine basis, they may tell you something different. Um, I've only seen very few instances because again, I work with pediatrics mostly. Um, and so my experience with TB is typically um, rare cases of kids with like cancer who've been chronically immunosuppressed who may have it or rare cases of HIV in children who have TB now. Uh, sometimes you'll have kids flying in from foreign countries where maybe TB was more widespread and they have it. So the few times I haven't really run into too many of the visual disturbances, it's just really well known with that particular drug there. Um, other things with pyrazinamide, you'll see is this increase um, in liver function tests. You wanna watch out for that. Um, it can inhibit uric acid secretion. So this would be a bad thing for patients with gout, for instance. Uh, and then we typically avoid this in pregnancy. I'm not even going to talk about TB in pregnancy. It's a whole other ball of wax um, for sure. Although I guess it, I guess you can call TB sort of a ball of wax, that little mycolic acid layer, but it's what it is. So looking at this, you know, if um, typically, you know, if there's isoniazid or rifampin resistance, then that usually ends up extending out the treatment time. So maybe you've been doing like 18 to 24 months worth of therapy there, which again can be really, really difficult from a compliance standpoint. And there's other drugs that have been used as well. So if like you couldn't use something like a Thambutol for whatever reason or parazinamide, this is where other drugs can come into play here. I'm not going to ask about these specifically on the test. I just want to give you some examples of things that can be used and have been used. So if you see this, it's not atypical. It's just meaning that it was probably used as an alternative to one of the other big four that I just mentioned here. Um, so, But none of these are totally safe on their own. They all have their own problems. Um, but sometimes you'll see things like fluoroquinolones or macrolides being used here, linazolid even has some activity, so it really just depends on the situation, but um, you know, you can certainly do further reading and kind of learn more about that if you like, but that's sort of the extent I'm getting to with that. Uh, someone had a question. Someone said, uh, when you say rapid tolerance for rifampin, does that mean TB quickly develops resistance to it? Yeah, especially if you were to use it by itself, that means that the TB would become, they would mutate uh, to where it would develop resistance against that, um, uh, that rifampin, either uh, maybe they'll upregulate a certain protein, a certain enzyme, or they'll change a certain target, something like that, to make it more resistant to it. All right, we still got some more time here, so let's talk about anaphylaxis treatment. So, um, kind of switching gears from the infectious to going more into um, you know reactive airway disease, and I didn't have another good place to put anaphylaxis management, so I wanted to put it here because this is sort of a respiratory condition uh, in, in many instances for more severe cases, though. 
But, you know, what is anaphylaxis? Well, it's a severe systemic allergic reaction, right? And we know it affects a ton of different organ systems. And it's important to know kind of like which organ systems you're trying to manage, like which ones are manifesting symptoms that you want to use medications for. Um, and again, the big thing we worry about is one, the cardiovascular collapse, because you're typically going to see patients are going to be hypotensive if they're more severe. Uh, the tachycardic, which can lead to arrhythmias. And then we worry about the airway obstruction, all that edema that occurs in the airway. Um, you know, it's it's a, a sad thing or kind of unfortunate thing if you have to end up having to do a cricothyrotomy on these patients here. Hopefully you can get the airway beforehand, but that's what we're trying to avoid. Make sure we keep, maintain that airway. That's what a lot of our medications are going to be helping with as well. And of course, these allergic actions, uh, reactions can happen with anything. It could be medications, it could be animal, it could be lots of things here. Um, again, it could be due to ingestion of something like a food, or it could be just uh, breathing in and exposure to some sort of allergen. It really just depends on the situation there and just how severe the reaction was going to be in the first place. Um, so what are we looking for here? Well, certainly you'd expect severe airway uh, edema here. So you can see laryngeal edema lower airway edema, which may present as like bronchoconstriction, wheezing, kind of looks like asthma a little bit. Um, and you can develop, uh, you know, severe strider wheezing associated with that, which is definitely a bad sign. You know, if you have someone who had eaten a peanut and then all of a sudden they're now wheezing and it's not because of like a peanut in the airway, um, that's not a great sign as you'll see there. Um, again, per cardiovascular collapse, meaning just profound hypotension, just due to all that histamine, all that stuff being released, all those inflammatory cytokines. That's a, usually a very bad sign there. And then you can also have some degree of gastrointestinal signs and symptoms. Earlier, I was talking about how H2 blockers can prevent production of stomach acid. Well, in this case here, you have a ton of histamine being released. It can activate all the H2 receptors. It can lead to things like vomiting, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, abdominal pain, things like that. So really a lot of different organ systems all being affected here. So a couple of different things I'm gonna go through here. Um, you know, Some of these things are situational, right? Not every single one of these patients with a, an allergic reaction is going to get every single one of these things, but we'll talk about where they're going to be useful. And so I've talked about volume expansion previously. I think I mentioned this at the, the PEDS talk during the pharmacodynamics course, but just to reiterate here, here's where we can utilize IV crystalloids to help out with intravascular volume, right? A lot of these patients will get very vasodilated especially with the more severe cases, and they will develop these really leaky capillaries, and this is what leads to a lot of the edema that happens here. But because all that volume is leaving the blood vessels, it leads to having this hypotension um, and relative decrease in blood volume, right? And so what we want to do is to be able to help replace that if we can. So there's two ways we could do that. We can either fill the tank back up, fill the hose back up with more fluid, or we can constrict back down on the hose, okay? We're gonna look at both ways we can do that here in just a minute. But first way I wanted to try to fill up the, the volume again. Um, and so this is where IV crystalloids come into play here. Uh, when I say crystalloids, it's not like an alien race I'm talking about. It just basically means any kind of fluid that is salt containing. So this could include your lactated ringers. It can include um, you know, normal saline and, and lactated ringers, probably the most common ones you're gonna run into. But I'll mainly focus on 0.9% sodium chloride here uh, for our purposes. That's kind of the most common one um, uh, you're going to be seeing here in, in the ER sort of setting, right? Um, now, again, 0.9% sodium chloride, that is normal saline. It's a really good number to remember, 0.9%, because you'll see that come up again and again. Um, so if you ever wanted to see like half normal saline, that would just be 0.45% sodium chloride. Whoops. Um, if I was dealing with hypertonic saline, it would be anything greater than 0.9, like 3%, for instance. So it's a good number to, to, to know that that is normal saline, right? Why is it normal? Because it's about the tonicity of our blood. So if, if you're curious. So um, what we want to do is try to increase the intravascular volume. So you give a fluid bolus up front. And so you, here you start out with like 20 mLs per kilo, which for most adult patients is between one to two liters. If they come in and they're already like profoundly hypotensive, you'll probably just go ahead and shoot more for the two liter mark. Because in some cases you may even need like four to eight liters. This is how extremely profoundly vasodilated and leaky all those, those vessels are that they need this much fluid just to tank them back up and to increase the intravascular pressure, right? Um, most of these patients will also be put on maintenance rates afterwards. So usually you'll hear one and a half times maintenance, two times maintenance. Remember, you figure out their maintenance rate based off of this 421 rule. This is more for kids, but you can see this apply to adults too. It'll give you a pretty good idea of what their maintenance rate should be. Um, you know, most people just say, okay, well, 
125 mLs an hour for adults as maintenance, which is fine for the most time, but you may have patients very large, very small, that may not be totally appropriate for it. So you can't go wrong with the 421 rule. Just recall, you know, it's four mLs per kilo for the first 10 kilograms, two mLs per kilo for the second 10, and then one mL per kilo for every kilogram after 20. So if you had a patient who's like 60 kilograms, then it'd be 40 mLs an hour for their first 10 kilograms of weight, 20 mLs an hour for the second 10, and then they'd have 40 kilograms left over to account for, so that's 40 mLs a minute, or otherwise their maintenance rate would be 100 mLs an hour. If you said start them off at two times maintenance, then you just do two times this, and you say, okay, 200 mLs an hour, um, after their fluid bolus of two liters, right? Uh, so that's kind of the process that we go through for that. If you need some refreshers, I'd say either go back to the old uh, videos where I talk about that, or if you have questions, you can always email me and we can chat about it. All right, so up next is gonna be epinephrine. And so this is gonna be sort of the, the main lifesaver of patients having severe anaphylaxis. And again, this is something where, um, you know, if patients have a history of anaphylaxis, they probably already have some epinephrine on them. Uh, at any given time, or at least if they're, they're good patients, they should be carrying it with them. I've seen a few who decided that they didn't need to carry it with them. It's been so long since they've had an exposure, and they got into trouble that way. So they should carry it with them. Anyway, so, you know, epinephrine itself is an endogenous catecholamine. It's just like the epinephrine that our adrenal glands release on a normal basis and is able to act on both alpha and beta receptors. And so this is beneficial for two reasons, one of which being the alpha effects, it's gonna help the vasoconstrict the blood vessels. It will decrease that vascular permeability. So we just put in a whole bunch of fluids into the patient, but instead of leaking all those out into the interstitial tissue, we wanna keep it in the vessel, and that's where that vasoconstriction really helps out with that, okay? Next, we have the beta effects, and this is primarily where we're gonna focus on the beta-2 effects. Affecting that bronchial smooth muscle, you're gonna be able to relax that and allow for better airflow, okay? As we saw that when you have this massive allergic reaction, that bronchial smooth muscle will then start to constrict. This helps to reverse that. Now, the beta-1 effects are mainly going to be affecting the heart. So most of these patients, if they're hypotensive, they're going to be tachycardic anyway. So this may worsen that to some degree, but that's kind of the taking the good with the bad. Um, some additional benefits you can get, including uh, leaving things like the pruritus, you know, urticaria, angioedema, can also be treated as well with this epinephrine. Here's an example of what an EpiPen looks like. Um, now, it's generally given either IM or sub-Q, like nine times out of 10. There's uh, rare instances where patients who are um, either having cardiovascular collapse or maybe they're already in cardiac arrest, that's when we'll use IV epinephrine um, because, uh, again, it's pretty miserable feeling to receive a big dose of epinephrine. It feels like just before you take a test, you get that impending sense of doom a little bit, right? Probably not as bad as adenosine, but um, it, it, it doesn't feel great. And so um, using IV uh, gets a lot stronger reaction much more quickly. So stick with IM. It, it's useful for most patients. And keep in mind, like a lot of patients have already received a dose of this prior to they getting to you. So that's where it's really important to um, ask EMS provider. So if you have a patient who's presenting to the ER via EMS, you want to ask, okay, what have they already gotten, right? Did they give themselves an EpiPen? The patient may not be in a mental state to even tell you. Um, so you got to be able to ask EMS. And again, those guys and gals, like they have a very busy schedule. They got to get out and get to the next call. So you got to make sure you take a few seconds to talk to them, get the report out, figure out what happened before you lose them. Because once they're out of there, if the run sheet isn't too super descriptive, then you may not know what happened with the patient. And they may not need an extra dose of epi. It just depends on, on the situation. So uh, make sure you talk to your EMS providers. Um, they can be very helpful in giving you a better clue about what was going on with the patient beforehand, right? Anyway, so there's several different um, concentrations of epi that are out there. Um, it's very important you don't get these screwed up that are out there. And this is actually an older nomenclature that is starting to go away, um, but you still may see it occasionally. They'll say epi 1 to 1,000 or 1 to 10,000. That's a measure of the concentration of the epi. Um, and just to give you an example, 1 to 1,000 means 1 milligram and 1 ml. I said, what's the half-life for uh, epinephrine? It's pretty fast. Yeah, it works very quickly. Um, I don't know the half-life is off the top of my head, but it's, it's, it's quickly working. Um, and then 1 to 10,000 would be 1 milligrams and 10 ml. So that's a tenfold difference. If you screw this up and give the wrong one, you're either giving a one-tenth of the dose you thought you were giving or you're giving tenfold dose. And we're going to see that can lead to some problems in either way, either being not too effective or being way too effective. Uh, Shelby's saying I've had a few anaphylactic reactions. It's like magic how fast that stuff works. Yeah, it kicks in very quickly. It's very uh, very handy when, when it's needed for sure. Um, 
So some of the adverse effects you're going to see there, it would just be like if your sympathetic nervous system would like just dump a whole bunch of norepi or epi all at the same time. And so you can see anxiety, you can see blood pressure increase, which is probably okay for some of these patients if they're hypotensive to begin with. Um, tachycardic, nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis, very common reactions here. Remember, if they get too much, they have an overdose of it, that can lead to way too much vasoconstriction, can lead to MI, can lead to cerebrovascular hemorrhage, all kinds of bad things have happened here. So you got to get that right. Um, I recall one time, you know, we, are, we had one patient who was in cardiac arrest. And I remember that um, these concentrations almost got us into trouble because uh, I think I was helping out with uh, one of the providers uh, coming up with an idea for what kind of drugs we we're going to use or something. And But the, there was two nurses who were working the crash cart where they had all the medications at. And there's a couple different forms of epi that were in there. There's the Refilled syringe that you normally use during a code to, to push every three to five minutes or so. But there's also a big vial of it that's um, basically uh, one milligram per ml, 30 ml. And sometimes you use that as a backup if you have to make your own um, uh, you know, injections of epinephrine. And so uh, there was a, a more seasoned nurse that was working. She was working with a more junior nurse. And the uh, the senior nurse was like, hey, take one of those epis and go ahead and put it into a bag of saline. And we'll make an epi drip the doctor had ordered and so um the junior nurse was like oh just do the whole thing and the senior nurse wasn't looking she said yeah the whole thing not realizing what they were each talking about were two different things the more senior nurse was talking about just the one syringe of one milligram of epinephrine the junior nurse was holding up the vial of 30 milligrams of epinephrine so she'd injected all 30 milligrams into that bag and that would have been a 30 fold overdose for that patient right fortunately we were able to catch it beforehand to use that as a teachable moment for that junior nurse. I'm sure she never made that mistake again. Um, but again, it's easy to screw things up. So again, be very specific with these things here. Exactly. Closed loop communication is the key to keeping your patients nice and healthy. Because again, it's like seconds to minutes between when a provider says do this and it happening in those type of situations. Okay. Be really cautious here. Make me scared to go to the hospital. Uh, it is a scary place. I'm not going to lie. Um, usually safe for people working there, but um, you got to got to be careful. There's a lot of inter a lot of a lot of mistakes happen, and hopefully, I'm teaching you some of the basics here, so that way you'll avoid some of these mistakes too when when you're out there. So, um, next up, we have our H uh, histamine blockers here. So we can either focus on H1 or H2. I should probably actually remove this. This is not going to be useful anymore because this was taken off the market just this past year. So look at me not even keep my stuff up to date. I apologize. This is so embarrassing. Um, you should do something like Fomodity. Oh, it's not even the right color here. So um, actually, uh, ranitidine was taken off the market this year because of the fact that there's a carcinogenous, uh, carcinogenous, is that the word? carcinogenic uh, product um, that it can actually degrade into. And so they actually removed it from the market this year. Um, but famotidine is another common one you'll see used in place of it. But regardless, um, when you have someone who's having um, an anaphylactic reaction, they're releasing all this epinephrine or all this histamine out into the body. And so we want to be able to reverse those effects if we can. And so this is a case here where, um, you know, yeah, Zantac's your go-to, no longer, you can't get it anymore, right? Um, but looking at uh, this, you know, if a patient's severe enough to need epinephrine, they're probably going to get all these medications we're talking about. Not every patient needs epi though, right? If they're coming in and they're complaining of a very slight wheeze and, you know, just feeling a little itchy, they may not need the full court press, right? So again, it's all going to be based off of sort of how severe the reaction is. Most patients are probably going to get an H1 blocker at the very least, okay? Because again, they're, if they're having pruritus or rash, things like that, this can be helpful for all those cutaneous effects. So generally, we'll give something like diphenhydramine, hydroxazine potentially, um, any of the H1, usually first generation is what we're going with here. We want to get as effective as possible. So we'll do um, an H1 blocker usually Benadryl, uh, and that will deal with that. And then sometimes we'll end up doing an H2 blocker as well, which will help out the GI effects. This is kind of plus minus. I don't know that I see a lot of people use this all the time. Probably more often the more severe cases just really depends there. But famotidine would be a good option there. I'm going to talk to you much more about the H2 blockers in GI next semester. So you can just kind of hold that in the back of your head. Uh, bronchodilators can be used as well. We're going to talk much more extensively uh, extensively about albuterol coming up here in just a little bit um, when we get to the asthma section. But basically, this works as an inhaled way to get uh, a beta-2 agonist to activate those receptors and relax the smooth muscle, which will help out with the airflow 
We'll talk about the side effects more later, but you can see things like anxiousness, tremor, tachycardia as being sort of common side effects of that, depending on the dose they're getting there. And then most of these patients are also probably going to get corticosteroids. If they're having a severe enough reaction when they're having to come to the urgent care of the hospital, they're probably going to get an H1 antagonist, and they're probably going to get a, a short course of corticosteroids, usually about five days or so. Again, not everyone needs fluids, not everyone needs epinephrine, but most people are probably going to get an H1 blocker or corticosteroid. So kind of keep that in mind. You know, if I tell you on a test question, I say, you know, patient um, comes in, they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic, you know, they say they feel like they can't breathe and they're starting to have strider, like, yeah, they need epinephrine. That's definitely the go-to drug in that case there. But if they come in and they're just having a little bit of itching and um, otherwise no other symptoms, you know, then maybe a dose of Benadryl and a couple of days of corticosteroids is all they need, right? So really kind of take into the, the clinical vignette in mind to see like what might be most necessary here. But and again, for a test, I'm going to make it very clear cut for you guys. I'm just being more vague because I'm thinking of it on top of my head right now. But Anyway, corticosteroids are absolutely necessary for a lot of these patients here because not only does it work for sort of the immediate period, but it can also help out with more of the delayed period, right? Because frequently, you know, patients will have more of a delayed manifestation of uh, allergy and anaphylaxis hours and days down the road that we're trying to prevent those symptoms from coming back. The thing with corticosteroids, though, is that it takes time to work because if you know where it works at, it's down at the nucleus, right? It has to change gene transcription and all of that. So it's not going to work as fast as a dose of epi. As I think Shelby was saying, that stuff works quick. On the other hand here, um, you're going to see that uh, corticosteroids take some, several hours to kick in, okay? which is fine. You can get that going on same time they get in the epi, and it's fine. It'll start to kick in in a couple hours as the epi's wearing off, and you're good to go. Usually, we'll use things like prednisone, dexamethasone as oral options. Um, you know, if it's a less severe reaction, you're going to send them home. You know, prednisone, dexamethasone is reasonable. For IV forms, we'll typically go with something like methylprednisolone. It's a more common thing there. Um, usually five days or so, depending on the severity of, of reaction. Um, and again, it's funny too, because like, you know, if you're in the ER setting, like, you know, it's very fast paced and everyone's, you know, nerves are ramped up and you have a EMS call and say, we got a anaphylaxis coming in, patients intubated, getting epi and everyone's kind of ramped up and ready to go. And, you know, um, me working in the ER, like I'm trying to make sure I get all my stuff ready to go, kind of anticipate what medications we're going to need. You know, especially in peds, you got to make sure everything is very exact based on the patient's weights. I'm kind of all this stuff. And then, um, you know, I'll have the getting things ready and the nurse is like, where's the steroids? And I'm like, well, I'm working on this other stuff first. Steroids are coming. Don't you worry about it. She's like, we need the steroids. I'm just like, steroids aren't going to save the patient right this moment. Let me get the epi ready. Let me get the Benadryl ready. Then we can worry about the steroids because that'll take hours to work. But oftentimes uh, people don't want to hear that. They just want everything done right now. So that can be a bit of a challenge when working with some of those high stress uh, sort of uh, personalities there in, in those moments. But, you know, if you can be the calm person in the room, that is always very beneficial. So what you guys sound like on the radio too. Yeah, exactly. It always sounds like, you know, uh, a TV drama or something. So for, <laughs> that, uh, did I do that unconsciously? That might be me showing a, a little bit of my bias there. My goodness. I love, I love EMS people. I love paramedics and firefighters. Some of the best friends I ever made working in the ER were like the paramedics and firefighters. They're awesome uh, to work with there. Anyway, let me see if there's other questions. All right, let's see. Uh, so would epinephrine be an alpha and a beta agonist? Uh, yes, both, right? They will sort of um, work on alpha beta one and beta two, alpha one, beta one, and beta two, they work on all of them equally. Um, and so that's a very good thing to know about how that drug works. So again, alpha and beta agonists, just like the normal epinephrine that we release. And what's funny too, is you have some people that'll say like, oh, I have an epinephrine allergy, which I always thought was really funny because it's like, well, you can't be allergic to epinephrine because you'd be dead because your body produces epinephrine. But the thing to think about too with drug allergies is that that vial of epinephrine doesn't just include epinephrine. There's other stuff in there. So there could be preservatives. There could be, um, you know, uh, antibiotic sort of compounds. There could be lots of other things. Those are called adjuvants. Uh, and that is oftentimes what the patient may be reacting to. So for instance, a lot of the epinephrine products that are made uh, contain sulfites. And sulfites may be something the patient has a reaction to. So if you ever see like a preservative-free product, it'll say sulfite-free, and that is something a patient could get. Even if they have an epinephrine allergy, you could still administer that, and that they will likely not have a problem with it. Because again, it's impossible for them to have a true epinephrine allergy because it's a natural compound that they produce. Yeah, they definitely say it all the time, yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Can the TB antibiotics penetrate granulomas, turbi- uh, tubercules, I guess I should say, uh, in lungs that contain macrophage ingested TB, or can they only target free-floating TB in the lungs? That's a good question. I haven't really ever thought about it that way. I'm sure they have some degree of penetration into those macrophages, but I would have to do a deeper dive on that. Um, again, I'm no, by no means an expert in TB. Uh, again, I deal with it fairly rarely, um, but if you talk to someone who works like an infectious disease, more frequently, they would probably have a better idea. Honestly, it's a little outside of my wheelhouse, so I'd have to do some further research to find out. But if you find out, if you go look it up to date or something and learn something, well, let me know. I'd be happy to know. Okay. I think I missed something conceptually, but could you explain why you would want to administer fluids with anaphylaxis again? Absolutely. Right. So think about what's happening with anaphylaxis. You have someone who gets, uh, say, they have a peanut allergy, they get exposed to a peanut, um, and all of a sudden, they are just releasing, the mast cells are just dumping all, all of these inflammatory cytokines. They're dumping epinephrine and, uh, I'm sorry, dumping histamine, dumping uh, serotonin, all this junk out into the into the body, and it's causing a system-wide inflammatory reaction, right? One of those things you're going to find is going to be this vasodilation. That's why they get flushed. That's why they get uh, hypotensive. And so the hypotension is what we want to treat there because their vessels get very dilated and they also get very leaky. So you lose all this fluid out into the interstitial uh, tissue. Not that the fluid's gone. It's just not there in the vasculature. And because it's not there in the vasculature, it can't provide pressure, right? So your vessels are dilated out and they also have low volume in them. So that's why they're hypotensive. And that leads to reflex tachycardia, which can lead to arrhythmia. So we want to be able to fix that. So one, we can give epinephrine, which works as a vasoconstrictor. If you heard the term vasopressor, that's what that means. It will constrict down on the vessels by activating the alpha-1 receptors. But you can decrease the diameter of the vessel, but if there's no volume in there for it to press against, then there's no pressure. So that's why we give the fluids. We administer IV crystalloids like normal saline, and that will then tank up the patient, so to speak, and provide that inter- um, provide for the um, intravascular volume to be repleted, and that provides you pressure, right, to pump around the blood and get oxygen to where it needs to go. So that's why we do fluids for those patients there. Again, if they come in and they're only complaining of some GI upset, uh, some rash, itching, um, no respiratory symptoms, and their blood pressure looks fine, they're hemodynamically stable, you don't have to give them fluids, right? It's just that they were coming in and they're hypotensive. Those are the type of people that would definitely require it, right? Something to consider there. All right, so all the questions I have on there. Do you guys have any other questions? Um, jumping into asthma is going to be a big topic, so I don't want to necessarily try to jump into that right now, although it's a good continuation on from uh, anaphylaxis, but I think we're at a good stopping point. It's about halfway through the slides here, so hopefully... You guys are not going to feel gypped if I end 10 minutes early or 13 minutes early. Um, you know, you can put in my review if you're really that uh, sour about it. But um, otherwise, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, and you guys can have a great day. Otherwise, have a great weekend. Hopefully, you don't have anything after me. Um, usually, usually for like in person, I usually take up all the time most of the time. So you guys can feel thankful for one thing of being distant is I usually end a little early. So. Uh, Have a great weekend. Uh, Stay safe out there, and I will see you next time. I'll be on for a few minutes in case anyone has any last-minute questions. Yep. Someone was saying, let's see here, if you don't have enough fluids and you give pressors, would this cause a constriction of blood flow to your extremities and cut off circulation? That's a good question. I'll, I'll talk about that more when we get into talking about, like, ICU sort of like emergency medicine sort of uh, stuff there. Um, yeah, I can answer a question about that too if you want to post it out. Um, so with that, you're going to see that um, absolutely, if you give vasopressors, you can cause decrease in circulation. It doesn't matter what their fluid status is like. You can still cause constriction. So think about this. So like if we're giving something like epinephrine, it's mimicking what our sympathetic nervous system would normally do or what our you know, adrenal glands would do. And so if you think about it, if you're in a fight or flight response, you know, I don't have to worry about digesting my food, right? I don't want to have to think about urinating because I want to keep that blood volume anyway. So you tend to find that by giving vasopressors, you can cut off circulation to certain areas like the GI tract, to the kidneys, the microvascular circulation, like to the fingers and the toes. And so you can actually find that you can cause um, decreased circulation and cause damage to those tissues. So for instance, you'll find that chronic vasopressors um, like an epi drip or something would lead to uh, GI ulcers, right? Because you're cutting off blood flow to the stomach and that can lead to uh, ulcer formation. Um, there's been cases of gangrene in the fingers and the toes because you cut off circulation uh, due to that. So that is a problem, not just with fluids, but a single dose of epinephrine, probably not going to do that, 
However, if I were to give like an epi drip to uh, someone in the ICU for hours and hours and days and days, that could be a problem. And in fact, sometimes what I'll get called at the poison center uh, is actually an epi, um, I have an accidental epi, trying to think of epi pen administration to the finger. And that's actually kind of interesting um, because people accidentally inject themselves on the finger with an epi pen, uh, and then the finger will get really blanch. It'll get really cool to the touch because they've cut off all that circulation by constricting all those vessels there. And so that can actually be a problem because if you cut off circulation for long enough, you starve the tissue of oxygen and it can start to die off. And so we can do things like warm compresses to try to aid drug uh, uh, drug absorption. We can do things like vasodilators in the area. So it just depends on, on how to manage that. Yeah, it's like giving Lido with Epi to the digit. Yeah, you just want to do um, so any any terminal end of circulation. So they say uh, finger, penis, nose, and toes. You don't want to use uh, epinephrine in your lidocaine uh, frequently. So that or ever because that can cause decrease in, in uh, blood flow. So very good, uh, Jackson's good point. Um, so Andrew's asking the show from a statistician's standpoint, what are your opinions on the methodology of how political polls are currently conducted? Do you think changes need to be made because they've been off? In recent years, oh boy, Andrew, that's a that's a question. I don't know if I can answer that uh, fully. Um, you know, for one, I'm not a statistician, but um, you know, I think with political stuff, it's really tough because the question is is like, who do they ask and how do they ask it? And so that's why it's so tough for these things. And you can find changes in polls from you know, um, you know, CNN does this poll and it says this, and you know, Fox News does this poll and it shows this. And a lot of it can be like, how do they ask the question? Who were they polling there? Um, is there a better way to do it? I don't know. Um, yeah, 538 seems to be a pretty um, better one in terms of like bias, but like everything has bias in it when it comes to like politics. So it's almost impossible to totally remove that. Um, so it's tough though. Like I, I wish I had a better answer for that too. It'd probably be a lot richer if I could uh, come up with like a perfect means of, you know, uh, asking political questions and getting good answers. So, you know, and, and human beings are just uh, unpredictable. You know, they may say th one thing in a poll and then go do something else. That's, that's part, of, part of our, uh, um, you know, just uh, you know, the randomness of us is we'll just do things at random. So, um, so someone said, why is EpiPen so expensive? Is there any alternative for our patients? Um, it's expensive because it's a, it's a specific device. And so they hold the patent to that. And so um, depending on how long they had that patent for, um, it can lead to sort of them being the only supplier. So they kind of set the price for it. So a lot of it has to do with that. A lot of that can do with like insurance coverage. Um, there's not a lot of good alternatives, unfortunately, because there's not really safe ways to have patients. You know, with an EpiPen, very simple. They pop off the top of that thing, they jam it into the side of their leg, the dose injects, and you're done. Versus if you're having an anaphylactic reaction and you were to have to draw that up into a syringe out of your own vial of epinephrine, um, that could be tough because you might be sitting there shaking, not even able to, to get the, the needle into the vial to actually draw it up, right? Or you might not have anyone there with you to, to do it. So the dosage form convenience is really the thing that they're paying for. Now, should it be more easily available? Absolutely. I, I certainly think so. But unfortunately, kind of is what it is, unfortunately, unless they have good insurance to help cover for that sort of thing. So I wish I had a better answer for that too, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Any other questions from you all? Thank you. That was good questions. Uh, someone said, I want to thank you for entertaining all of our questions. You make learning so much better. Oh, you're very welcome. I like to answer stuff, even if I don't have good answers. I at least like to try to answer them. I'll be the first person to tell you I don't know everything, because I certainly don't. That's a very nice sentiment. All right. Well, I have some more other meetings to get to, but thank you all for joining me. If you have questions, email me. Otherwise, I will see you all later.